descend on us. Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. Let your light shine upon our hearts and enable us to understand your word and fill us with the knowledge of your will. Father, I am as good as dead without your spirit. Fill me with your spirit and enable me to speak your word in its fullness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our study of the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. At the heart of the law is the Ten Commandments. In a way, Deuteronomy is an exposition on the Ten Commandments. One thing that strikes me about Deuteronomy is that it's not a dry legal document. It is a passionate call for transformation. And reading it is breathtaking, moving, transformative because of its power and scope. And the more I study Deuteronomy, the more I realize that this ancient book was way ahead of its time. In the West, the greatest philosophers of all time are the Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. They lived around 500 BC. Dr. Dallas Willard, who used to teach philosophy at USC, once said that one of the most beautiful books besides the Bible is Plato's Republic. It is a great book because it grapples deeply with the weighty questions of life. These are questions such as, what is the meaning of justice? How do you become a good person? And how do you build a just society? There is much wisdom in the teachings of Plato and Aristotle which is about part of God's common grace bestowed upon all humanity. But they fail to understand the human nature and their project to build a just society did not succeed. According to Dr. Willard, the Greeks became so violent that they had to ask the Romans to come in and intervene to keep the Greeks from killing one another. But the questions that they grappled with are still very much relevant for us today. So how do we become a good person? How do we build a just society? For the answer, we must go back 1,000 years before the time of Plato and Aristotle, long before Plato and Aristotle existed, God gave the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, through Moses. The Torah was way ahead of its time. In the Torah, among the many amazing ideas, we find at least three foundational ideas about the human nature. Now we are used to these ideas from the Bible that we don't realize how extraordinary these ideas are. They are absolutely foundational for becoming a good person and for building a just society. You know them already 
but let us review those ideas, three ideas about the human nature. First, all humans are created in the image of God. All of us here know that. But this idea is no longer taught in public schools. In fact, the only idea allowed in public schools regarding the origin of humans is that humans are a product of a random process called the Darwinian evolution. Humans are essentially no different from animals, just differently evolved. This rejection of the inherent dignity of human beings has enormous consequences if the society does not recognize the inherent dignity of humans, then it would devalue its weakest members. Those who are deemed burdensome to the society, the unborn child in the womb, the mentally and physically impaired, the disabled elderly, are treated as dispensable. And if individuals do not recognize that they are designed and created by God, then they would devalue their own body. If their body is a product of randomness and chance, then why not change it according to their feelings? With the progress in medical technology, they can now take drugs to block their natural hormone and remove their natural body parts. Today, teenagers can decide to do this to their body without the consent of their parents. This is a disaster of unimaginable proportion. Our society needs to know that each person is created in the image of God. Each one of us is of immeasurable value. Our worth does not depend on our abilities or our feelings. We are infinitely valuable because we bear the image of God in us. We have intrinsic dignity simply by virtue of being God's sons and daughters. Dignity, as one philosopher defines it, is worth that has no substitute. Most things in life have a price. That means we can substitute for it by paying the price. For example, a cell phone has a price. If it's broken, then we can pay for it and get a new one. But there is nothing in the world that can substitute for you. You are of infinite worth because you are created in the image of God. So this foundational idea is from the Torah, written 1,000 years before Plato and Aristotle. The second profound idea about the human nature is that all humans are infected with sin and our hearts are inclined toward evil. But in our society today, the notion of sin has been replaced by moral relativism. It's the idea that morality is something that our mind has constructed. There is no absolute right and wrong. What is right and wrong for me is different from yours. So you cannot tell me what is right and wrong for me. The greatest offense is to impose one's morality on others. But if we look around the world and look within our hearts, even with a small degree of honesty, 
we cannot deny the reality of evil. Think about what's going on in Ukraine. The people of Ukraine are familiar with the destructive power of evil. In the early 1930s, they suffered from a massive man-made starvation called Holodomor. Within two years, four to seven million people, four to seven million people in Ukraine died of starvation. And it was man-made starvation caused by Stalin's policies. And think about the war raging in Ukraine right now. Think about the indiscriminate bombing of civilians, the bombing of hospitals, schools, apartments, the total destruction of the city to rubble. Evil is real. The Bible teaches that evil exists not only in the visible realms, but also in the invisible realms, that is, in the heavenly realms and in the deepest recesses of the human heart. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Nobel laureate, once said, the line separating good and evil passes, not through states, nor between social classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. To become a good person and to build a just society, we must come to terms with the evil that passes right through our own heart. Now here's the third foundational idea about the human nature. As told in the book of Exodus, one of the deepest yearnings as humans is the yearning to be free. This yearning for freedom is so powerful that we humans will trade our life for freedom. Listen to this black spiritual O oh, freedom, O oh, freedom, O oh, freedom over me, and before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave, and go home to my Lord, and be free. Even though they are chained, and driven by their taskmasters day and night, Nothing can take away their yearning for freedom. They would gladly give up their life to go home to the Lord and be free. So deep is our yearning for freedom. That's why a totalitarian system is inherently unstable. By taking away freedom, they are constantly going against that powerful human yearning for freedom. The only way they can make the system work, at least for a while, is by repression. Unfortunately, a repressive regime can last for generations. By putting more repressive, repressive pressures on the people, until the system collapses, in a mass, massive destruction. And tragically, the people under a totalitarian system learn to survive by self-censoring, not saying anything contrary to official positions, and by agreeing with lies. In our society, we must watch out for a totalitarian tendency. If you share the biblical teaching on marriage and sexuality, you will be canceled, threatened, your reputation destroyed. You might even lose your job. 
And it's easy to retreat into a survival mode by self-censoring. But our Lord Jesus calls us to be witnesses to the truth, no matter what the cost is. Of course, we should not be foolish. We need to be as wise as a serpent in this secular age. We need to speak what we believe in with great wisdom, courage, and respect. Again, we are created to be free. And we cannot build a just society without freedom. Therefore, we must resist the totalitarian tendency. Now, you might ask, what kind of freedom is this? Is it freedom to do whatever we want to do? Is it freedom to pursue our desires? Is it freedom to follow our feelings? No, that kind of freedom leads to bondage precisely because of our sinful nature. Such freedom might give us momentary pleasures, but it make, makes us slaves to our feelings. So what then is the freedom that the Bible is talking about? It's freedom to be whom God has designed us to be. It's freedom to love God. Freedom to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's freedom to desire what Christ desires. It's freedom for the sake of others. And to enjoy such freedom, we must learn to submit ourselves to reality. Let me illustrate. Freedom to do whatever we want is like little children banging on the piano. They are free to bang on any keys, but what comes out is noise. <laughs> if you truly want to know freedom, Look at a virtuoso pianist playing the Mozart's piano concertos. When they first learn to play the piano, they find the arrangement of the piano keyboard unnatural to them. They first have to learn to submit themselves to the way the keyboard is arranged. They start with a simple scale and practice the scales over and over. As they train themselves to submit, they are able to express themselves more and more freely. And after many years of daily practice, they and the piano become one. And they are able to create something extraordinarily beautiful. Now that's freedom. To enjoy such freedom, we must learn to submit ourselves to the way the keyboard is arranged. Likewise, to enjoy true freedom, we must learn to submit ourselves to the law of God. The law of God is not a set of arbitrary rules. This is very important to understand. The law of God reflects the character of God. It reflects God's design for the good life. It reflects the reality that He created. And as our Creator, God knows what is good for us. He knows how we can become a good person and a just society. So to enjoy true freedom, we must learn to submit ourselves to the law of God. The essence of the law is summarized in the Ten Commandments, and we will touch on them briefly. The Ten Commandments were first given to the first generation of the Israelites who came out of Egypt at the foot of Mount Sinai, also known as Horeb. 
In Deuteronomy, the setting is almost 40 years after Exodus. And Moses is now speaking to the second generation, the majority of whom were not even born when their parents stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. But listen to what Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. He was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us, we who are, who are all of us who are alive here today, lest we might think that the word of God is only for our parents' generation, Moses is emphatic. So let me repeat verse 3 with a wooden translation from Hebrew. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, we who are here this day, all of us alive. The Word of God is living and active today. Every generation must hear the Word of God afresh. Every generation is responsible for living it. And we today, gathered in this sanctuary 3,500 3, years later, those who are gathered here must hear the Word of God afresh. These commandments are for us here today. So the Ten Commandments begin as follows. The prologue. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The Ten Commandments begin with a reminder about who God is and what he has done for us. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That reveals the character of God. The law is built upon the foundation of who God is and what he has done. God says to us, I have brought you out from the land of slavery. I have redeemed you from the bondage of sin. Now you belong to me. You belong in my family. You are my sons and daughters. Now that's grace. We have done nothing to earn this privilege of belonging to God. We have done nothing to deserve this grace. But God redeemed us while we were still sinners. It's all by grace. Grace comes before the law. Grace is the foundation. And the law is built upon the foundation of grace. Then God says, now that you belong to my family, this is how you live in my family. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship idols. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The first three commandments are about the vertical relationship, our relationship with God. Now there is reason the vertical relationship comes first. If we did not have the vertical relationship, our own love would dry out quickly and we would be running on empty. We must first be filled with God's love before we can love our neighbors, especially because 
Our neighbor is not always lovely. And we ourselves are not always lovely. And it is impossible to love our unlovely neighbor unless we are first filled with God's love. If our love depended on the response we get from our unlovely neighbor, then how long is our love going to last? We are sustained only by the unchanging love of Christ for us. That's why we must first take care of our vertical relationship with God and be filled with God's love. The fourth commandment is about the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath by Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The Sabbath is the bridge that connects the vertical and the horizontal relationships. It is by far the longest of the Ten Commandments, suggesting its great importance. Now, there is so much to be said about it, especially concerning freedom, and Lord willing, uh, we will say more about it when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 15. The fifth through the tenth commandments are about horizontal relationships. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Now, if we, if we ignore the tenth commandment for now and just focus on the fifth through the ninth, there seemed to be nothing exceptional about these laws. Most of them are found in other ancient Middle Eastern nations and other civilizations. For example, many variations of the commandments, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimonies, are found in the code of Hammurabi, a Babylonian king. The commandment to honor your father and mother is absolutely foundational in the teachings of Confucius. Now these are laws that all reasonable people arrive at using their God-given capacity to reason. This is what the theologians call common grace, or what some philosophers call common sense, which is God's given grace given to all humanity, both believers and non-believers. These laws are self-evident to all reasonable people. Without them, families would not survive. Societies would not survive. Civilizations would not survive. These laws are common to all societies. However, these laws, even though they are derived through reason, are not sufficient by themselves. Because of our sinful nature, desire is stronger than reason. And desire will override reason if we leave the desire unchecked. That's why a lot of reasonable people fall into addiction or idolatry. Reasonable people know that addiction is bad. They know that addiction is destructive, not only to themselves, but to relationships. But their desire overrides their reason. They are mastered by their desire. Reasonable Christians know about the teaching of Christ on the temptation of money and wealth, but their desire for comfort, financial security, and status 
overrides their intellectual knowledge, and they chase after the idols of comfort, security, and status. Now, we can cite many other examples, but reasonable people can be mastered by their desire, even though their reason says otherwise. So these self-evident laws are not sufficient by themselves. We need the first four commandments. We need to keep the vertical relationship before us. We need to keep Christ at the center. We need to be filled with Christ's love moment by moment. Now, the, the last of the Ten Commandments is not self evident. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, this is a commandment that cannot be enforced by law. Coveting is hidden inside our heart. No one else would know that we are coveting our neighbor's wife. No one can prove that we are coveting. But God sees all of that. The Tenth Commandment foreshadows the teaching of our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus emphasizes over and over that Sin cannot be reduced to external behavior. Sin dwells in our heart, in the deep recesses of our soul. Dr. Willard gives an insightful illustration. A thief is not just someone who steals. A thief is someone who would steal if the situation were right. There is a great difference between a person who would steal if the situation were right and a person who would not steal no matter what the situation is. Dr. Willer says that it's the difference in the soul of the person. One can have the soul of a thief but never dares to steal because he is afraid that he might get caught. This is what the Greek philosophers missed. They thought that they could build a just society by reason, by education, or by legislation. Now, all of those are good, but they fail to address the human heart. Our Lord Jesus says, if you harbor contempt towards your neighbor, then you have already committed murder in your heart. If you look at a woman with an intent to lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. Becoming a good person it's not simply a matter of modifying external behavior. We must go deeper into our heart. We must take care of the desire in our heart. If our heart is right with God, then our behavior will follow the heart and will take care of itself. So how do we take care of desire in our heart? How do we become free in our heart? How do we become a good person? How do we build a just society? Well, there is much more to be said from the book of Deuteronomy, and we will continue with the same topic next Sunday. As I close this message, I would like to invite you
to a moment of silent meditation. In the silence of our hearts, let us examine our hearts and respond to the Word of God. Father, we long to be free. We long to be free from the bondage of sin. Free to love you. Free for the sake of others. And we want to take the first step toward freedom. Take away the heart of stone and grant us a new heart and fill our heart with the love of Christ. In Jesus' name, 